Now that we have the necessary definitions, let's return to our discussion of using linear algebra to talk about codes. Our first definition is of a linear code. So a linear code, C, of dimension k and block length n over a finite field, f, is just a k-dimensional subspace of f to the n. Notice that this is in line with our earlier definitions of codes and use of k as the message length and so on. Indeed, note that if C is a code, just a plain old code, of block length n and message length k over the alphabet sigma is equal to the finite field f, then C is a linear code as per this definition, if and only if C is a subspace of f to the n. In particular, we can note that if the message length of the code is k, then the dimension is also k. And that's just because the size of C, if it's a subspace of dimension k, is equal to the size of f to the k. If this isn't obvious, pause the video and think about it. Why is the size of a subspace of dimension k, size of the field to the k. But if you believe this, then taking logs of both sides, we have that k is equal to the log base size of f of the size of c, which was exactly our definition of message length. So this all checks out. So a linear code is just a code that happens to be a linear subspace. Next we can define a generator matrix for a code. We already saw an example of this for the Hamming code, but now we can define it in more generality. So suppose that C is a linear code of dimension K, a subset of F to the N. We say that a matrix G in F to the N times K is a generator matrix for the code C, if the code C is the column span of G. That is, the code C should be the set G times X, where X ranges over all possible messages X in F to the K. So the picture looks like this. G is a tall and skinny matrix. It's N by K. We multiply it by our message X, also of length K, and what we're going to get is a code word C of length N. In this course, I'm always going to draw G generator matrices as being tall and skinny. It's also common to define generator matrices as short and fat and do the multiplication on the other side. Uh, it's just a difference of convention, but this is how we're going to be doing it in this course. One observation is that any linear code has a generator matrix. In particular, we can just take any basis for C, since it's a subspace of F to the N, and take those basis vectors and put them as the columns of G, and that'll do. A second observation is that generator matrices are not unique. There may be many generator matrices for the same code. In particular, up to permutations of the rows, there's always going to be a generator matrix that looks like this. That is, it has the identity matrix sitting up here, and then some other stuff down here. You can see this basically by row reducing the matrix G until it looks like this. That's not going to change the subspace spanned by the columns of G, so this is going to be a generator matrix for the same code. A generator matrix that looks like this is nice because it corresponds to what's called a systematic encoding. We say that an encoding map is systematic if the k bits of the message occur as the first k bits in the code word. And you can see that if your generator matrix looks like this and you multiply it by some message, then the code word that you're going to get out, because there's the identity sitting right here, is going to have the message as the first k bits of the code word. In particular, for a linear code, there is always a systematic encoding map. Next, let's define a dual code and a parity check matrix. First, a dual code. 
So suppose that C subset of F to the N is a linear code. We define the dual code to C as C perp, which we'll denote like this. C perp is equal to the set of all vectors V in F to the N, so that the inner product of V and C is equal to zero for all C in our code C. And here, this notation, this just means the sum from I equals one to N of VI times CI. So it's just the standard inner product. Notice that a dual code is exactly the same definition as a dual subspace from linear algebra. Okay, next definition, parity check matrices. We already informally defined a parity check matrix when we were looking at the example of the Hamming code a few videos back. And now let's define it in general. So suppose we have a linear code C, subset of F to the N, of dimension K. We say that a matrix H in F to the N minus K by K is a parity check matrix for the code C if C is equal to the kernel of H, or equivalently if C is the set of vectors so that H times X is equal to zero. So the picture looks like this. H is a short and fat matrix, which is N minus K by N. And it has the property that whenever we multiply it by a code word of C, we should get zero. As before, we can observe that any linear code has a parity check matrix. We just take the rows of the parity check matrix to be any basis for the dual of C. And as before, we can observe that parity check matrices are not unique. With these definitions under our belts, let's record some useful facts about generator matrices and parity check matrices. We've already seen some of these facts in the context of that Hamming code example a few videos ago. So I'm not going to prove them here because we essentially already did when we talked about the Hamming code, but you should make sure you understand why all of these are true. So let C be a linear code subset of F to the N that has dimension K, generator matrix G, and parity check matrix H. Then the following things are true. First, H times G is equal to the zero matrix. Second, the dual of C, C perp, is itself a linear code with dimension N minus K, generator matrix H transpose, so we take the parity check matrix for C and that becomes the generator matrix for C perp, and parity check matrix G transpose. So same thing, we take the generator matrix for C and that becomes the parity check matrix for C perp. Next fact, the distance of C is the minimum weight of any non-zero code word in C. We argued why this was true in the context of the Hamming code, and it's still true here for any linear code. All we needed was linearity. And our last fact, the distance of C is the smallest number D, so that the parity check matrix H of C has D linearly dependent columns. Again, we saw this in the context of the Hamming code example. So in that example, we had our little parity check matrix, and we wanted to say that the distance was three, and we argued that it sufficed to show that no pair of columns of H were linearly dependent. So that means that the smallest D, so that H has D linearly dependent columns, is three, and the distance was three as well. So again, all we really used was linearity, and this relationship holds for any linear code C but it's a good exercise to prove this for yourself. So that about wraps it up for this video. Thanks for watching.